Can you open up your special on Facebook page? You can just share it on my page. Uh -huh. This is very frightening. That's my giant face. Wait, what's that? That's what it's like. It's happening. <laughs> Meta that is. Yeah. <laughs> screen within a screen. Screen within a screen within yeah. a screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is for you to switch out when you're ready. No, no, you're gonna. Help oh, that's me. my job. Yeah. Can okay. You get a chair. I'm just seat. gonna. Huh? Can I just loiter right here while I'm yes. distracting? No. I'll interrupt you. Uh huh. I need to interrupt you. Oh, I need to get something from the top here. All these people coming to learn Torah, so awesome. For those following along on Facebook, feel free to, uh, oh, I just realized. Thank 
For those of you watching on the live stream, feel free to start popping your questions over. We're going to be talking about e food. We're going to be talking about separate beds. Um, or if you just want to like fan out about Stissel, feel free to send all your comments. No sound. Oh, okay. Uh -uh. No sound? Okay. Amy, can you hear us now? Okay, all right, testing. Is the sound working now for the Facebook Live? Um, they're on the back table. Can you hear us on the on the Facebook Live? It's a little delayed, so okay. we'll take that. Um, sure, there are some people who are supposed to be commenting. Oh, but should I go to the show one to see it? I'm saying to see the comments, though. So. I think it's like that. Allison, you want to check? Oh. There. Someone commented? Just one. Can you click that? We are closing commentary. Well, we are the comments. Oh, okay. You can hear okay, us. Good. Okay, yeah, yeah. People can hear us. Okay. Just please let us know if you can. Okay. All right. We're going to begin. Okay. Does everyone have a source sheet? We're going to begin. I hope that everyone online can uh, or on Facebook can hear us as well. Yep. Here you go. Okay, we are not going to admit publicly how long it took us to figure out some of this uh, tech stuff. Admit it, admit it, tell them. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know, uh, four or five hours? No. <laughs> They're not gonna pay us anymore. We're spending our whole day on the computer, okay. Um, yeah, so it took us a long time. We hope that it's gonna work. Um, obviously people will comment if it's not working. Yes. No, okay, but we I, then, we, then we fixed it, okay. We will, that will be different. Okay, what does that yeah. mean? Can you give the point? Okay. Yeah, it will All be right. different in a second. Yeah. So we're gonna, there, there's still one complication, which is when we go to the um, video clips, we're gonna have to change the mic. So it's a little bit, there will be like one complication as we're going. Hopefully it'll all be seamless. Uh, and we are starting our second Schnitzel class. Last class, I think we had people listening from really all around the world. Uh, it's pretty amazing. People were saying that they were in all these different countries in Alaska and other places in Europe, uh, listening to the lecture. There's a Stissel uh, Facebook page. Stissel, let's talk about it. Exactly, some of us are members on it. And uh, I think there are like 7,000 people on the, on the page. So we put it there. So a lot of people uh, started listening. And it's actually interesting because a lot of the questions um, that, are on, that are asked on that, on that Facebook page, I've, we've just taken some of those questions and we're, we're trying to answer them more comprehensively from a halakhic perspective. So tonight's lecture is all about, uh, there are two parts. I'm gonna teach half, Rabbanit Fruchter will teach the second half. Or the fourth, depending on how long it goes. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So the first part is gonna be on yichud, yichud for people who are not married. Uh, and the second half is going to be on separate beds. There are a lot of separate bed scenes, uh, e even for people who are married throughout different stages of their life and marriage. So I'm gonna deal with the Yichud part, Rabbi Fruchter will deal with the, the beds uh, part. And uh, when it comes to Yichud, we're gonna jump into, into some of the clips, but I know a lot of you have great Bikias. Bikias means great uh, uh, over, uh, an overview knowledge of the entire series. So just think about Yichud means seclusion. Uh, the idea of a man and a woman who are not married to each other. And we're gonna get into some of the nuances of exactly to whom does do the laws of yichud, the prohibition against secluding with each other, uh, apply. But just thinking through this, the, the TV uh, series, where do some issues of yichud 
of maybe violating, but maybe not violating Yichud. Where do they come up? There are a lot of great scenes. Yeah, Bashi, you're... Exactly, his women, his, his women friends. Uh, I, I, right, Aliza, Menucha. Who was, Re, what was Rebbe Re, Re, Re Cheshen, the Talmud Torah teacher? What was his wife's, Edna, Edna? Okay, so all those scenes. I mean, that was the great scene when he, uh, after the Shiva is over for, uh, for, for, he goes there and he starts talking and then he, and he says, you want to have something to eat? And he's like, okay, <laughs> and he comes in. And now he has his, uh, his, 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 his next, because by that point, the Lisa, I think, had gotten married to somebody else. But anyways, there are all those scenes. Anyone remember any other scenes besides for Shulam? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right, and they were driving together in a car, and that was probably something that Shulam would not have been uh, used to doing. Um, what about with Akiva? Remember things with Akiva? Exactly. Remember when Akiva visits Elishev in Bnei Brak, uh, there are lots of issues. And here's the interesting thing. In almost all the cases, they are technically following the laws of Yichud, because what do they always do? They leave the door open, right? Well, we're, we'll, let's assume for now that they are technically following the laws of Yichud, but some of those scenes are really full of a lot of uh, romantic emotions and feelings. And there's one scene, remember when uh, Akiva was, was painting um, Elisheva, and there was almost a, a kiss there at the studio, but they were following the laws of Yichud, right? But yet it still happened. So anyway, so let's jump into some of the scenes. So we're gonna switch the microphone here for a second. They Okay. <laughs> Netflix. Well. Wait, which one are you going? It's, um, Season one, episode yeah. 10. Okay, yeah. Minute 34. Oh gosh, what if the next thing is even worse? Okay. 31. Sorry, everyone. Amy Schumer. Sorry. Season what? Episode ten. Episode ten. Minute thirty-four. Vani. I'm going Yeah, let's read. No, I want to see it. That's interesting. Oh, this scene. Give it. Give it. Oh, let him find work here. I want to see the light
את יוצאת? אני הולכת למכולת להביא גם לבן בארוחת בוקר. חכה איתם בינתיים, אולי לשחיס, אם זה בסדר. אני אכין לנו חביתות? כן, תכין. מה אמרתי עכשיו? בתפילה? והרסתיך לי לאוי לו. והרסתיך לי בצדק. ומשפוט. וחסד וברחמים. פסוק יפה. זה מה שנעשה, אלישבע. נעשה מה? רק תתרסי את זה. אם את לא תרצי להתחתן, לא נתחתן. היה מצוין. אני מתכוון באמת. בואי נתארס. ניתן לנו חצי שנה להיות ביחד כמה שנרצה, בשקט, בנחת, בלי להתחבא. ובואי ננסה אחרי החצי שנה? אחרי חצי שנה? נראה. חצי שנה. זה הרבה זמן בשביל מישהו שכמעט נדרס את מי. טוב, תהפוך שלא תישרף. מייק? כן, אוקיי. אוקיי. אנחנו נעשה את זה בפייסבוק. נעשה את זה בפייסבוק. נעשה את זה בפייסבוק. נעשה את זה בפייסבוק. In the, in the um, last scene there, obviously you saw that when Elisheva came back, she was very careful to leave the, um, the door open just a few inches, but um, obviously they had a very uh, romantic, intimate moment. Uh, no touching, but obviously, you know, with the, with the pan and the fire and all that. Um, but I, one of the things that I was just so struck by that scene, and this is not even part of the class, is someone like Akiva. This is what, I think that when we watch, when we watch this, uh, series, I think that we feel this as people who are not living in this Haredi community. Someone like Akiva, who is not the best yeshiva student, and he is not considered this great scholar and whatever it is, but when he puts on his tefillin and he says those words, he understands what they mean, they have an impact, and they actually can, he, his whole world is living out through the tefillah. And this is someone who is not like his brother Tzviyarye, who's sitting in Kolel and learning, you know, he's off doing art. And I, I, when, when you see things like that, I, I do think that those of us who are not living in that world, I think that there is 
for me, there's a little sense of jealousy that that kind of a thing is not created in our own community with our own kids. And that's just something that I noticed as, as I was watching that. But anyway, it was a very powerful scene. Of course, even though they didn't explicitly, no one mentioned the term yichud, but that's what it was about. It was all about the idea of seclusion. So we are now going to, uh, how do I just go for it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you see there the next uh, picture that was just from the, the other scene that where I would say there was an issue of people following the laws of yichud because that was in the studio. Remember when she goes, she comes at first, then she leaves, comes back with her, uh, with her wedding gown. Um, and then they almost have this uh, kiss, but um, again, they're the, the, the studio's open, right? It's unlocked, the door's open a few inches, and that still obviously takes place. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna jump into the Gemara. You have a source sheet here, or if you want, don't wanna look at the source sheet, you can follow along. We have a, um, a PowerPoint presentation, so you'll be able to follow along with the PowerPoint as well. All of the sources that I am going to quote come from the same place, comes from the Gemara in Kedushin, uh, 80B to 81A. And um, what I decided to do, instead of bringing the halachic material, like the Shulchan Aruch and the codes and the responsa and the Sheol Suchuvos, I decided that instead what I would do is we would just learn it all from the Gemara. And I spent some time researching some of these topics and I'll just like give some extra information as we're learning it from the Gemara. But we'll learn it from the Talmud itself, all of the passages that relate to the issue of Yichud and try to understand them again as they go back to certain aspects of Shisel, but also to try to, try to think about it. So, the first Mishnah starts off, uh, source number one. There you go, it's up there in the, uh, on the uh, PowerPoint as well. Lo yit adam in nashim, avol isha achat mit in anashim. Right away, we begin with something which is not parallel, okay? It's not equal between men and women. What's the halacha? The Mishnah tells us that one man is not allowed to seclude himself with two women, but Two women, but two men are allowed to seclude themselves with one, uh, with one woman. Two men are allowed to seclude themselves. With, and the question is, what is the difference? Um, but before we get there, obviously the assumption of the Mishnah is that Yichud itself, if it would be one man and one woman, it would for sure be uh, prohibited. And just, just in terms of giving it a, a framing, right? Obviously they're concerned that when people are secluded with each other, it's gonna come to inappropriate behavior. Um, by the way, halachically, the issue of yichud, it's not a concern that they're going to come to other kind of physical intimacy, like kissing or other kinds of things. It's specifically a concern that it will lead to sexual relations. And you'll see that from some of the other halachos a little bit later on. But this is, this is considered the concern. What, what is the idea behind yichud? I, I listened to a bunch of shiurim before and, and read a lot of material, so I don't remember exactly where I heard this. But... Um, Someone, someone quoted a, another, a, a, another commentary on the, on the Torah and basically said the following idea. You know, oftentimes in life, and this sort of frames in, in my mind the whole issue of yichud, we think that we're going to have discipline and we're going to be able to stop ourselves from doing things that we don't want to do. But the truth of the matter is that when we're in the moment and the sin is right there in whatever kind of way it is, whatever sin we're dealing with, in that moment, it's oftentimes very hard to, to stop. And halachic boundaries are what's there to actually, they're there to actually help us not get to that point in the first place. So really, in order to be a pious person, in the moment, it could, you could be as pi, the most pious person in the world. You might sin, you might fall. The whole question is, are we setting the pro, appropriate boundaries in our lives around, especially around sexual inappropriate, sexually inappropriate behavior, are we setting those appropriate, appropriate boundaries in order to not get into that moment? And the laws of Yichud, I would say, are number one in terms of helping us. If you think about almost any sex scandal, sex scandal that's happened in the Jewish community and beyond, almost always it begins with violation of the laws of Yichud, almost always. And uh, if we're, that, you could be very careful with the laws of Yichud and things will still happen. But if you are careful with the laws of Yichud, our rabbis believed, and this is what our tradition believes very strongly, this is a way to hopefully prevent that. You're never gonna prevent everything, but this is a way to at least begin. So the first Mishnah actually distinguishes now between men and women, and the Mishnah tells us that, of course, one man is not allowed to be with one woman alone, but one man, right, is not allowed to be with two women, but two men, are allowed to be with one woman. And that is counterintuitive. 
if you're advising your young uh, daughter who's going off to college <laughs> and you say, okay, I don't want you to ever be alone with a man, with a guy. So what, so, she says, so what should I do? Should I have one of his friends there with him and me? Or should I go with one of my friends? What are you going to say? Of course, it's better to have two, two uh, young women and, and one man. That's what we would say, I think, today. But actually, the Mishnah has the opposite assumption. We're not going to spend so much time on it, but just to note it. And uh, what is the reason behind it? So look at the bottom of this source. The Gemara says, my taima. What's the reason? Oh, no one's going to like this, the answer here. <laughs> But what is the reason that one man is not allowed to be with two women? Why? You know, won't the two women protect, you know, protect each other? Okay, I don't even want to translate this, but basically, what does it mean? Uh, so literally it means, since women have a, a lot, the way it's translated here, women are of a light mind, okay? Now, actually, this has different contexts in different places uh, in the Gemara, at least it's used in different ways. That same language, Nashim Daitum Kalos, is also used to explain why we say that, uh, why at least in traditional circles and why the Gemara says that there's a danger in teaching your daughter uh, Torah. One should not teach your daughter Torah because of Nashim Daitum Kalos Alem, because they are of a light mind, if you will. But here it's not about intellectual capabilities, and I'm not even sure that's what it means uh, when it comes to studying Talmud. Here what it means, at least the way that Rashi says it, it's not in your source sheet, but Rashi says, um, the reason why is because since women, both, even if there are two women, okay, you try, the man will try to seduce one and he'll be able to seduce the other as well. That's how Rashi says it. Meaning the rabbis have a belief, and I think this comes up a lot in the laws of yichud, of all of the laws around sexual boundaries and prohibitions. I think that the rabbis basically had a belief that, first of all, men, have, have very, very strong sexual desires and urge and have a very hard time controlling themselves. But also that like all these laws in a certain way are just to make sure the men can control themselves. But once the men, you know, are not following the laws, the women will for sure give in because they're not gonna, they're not gonna be able to have the, the strength. You know, that's what they're, that's what they're, that's, it seems like that's what they're, they're assuming, obviously. Uh, difficult uh, assumptions for us in the modern world, but this is definitely what the rabbis are thinking. And this is the first source. Now, why is it in the reverse case that if there are two men and one woman, why do the rabbis not consider this to be um, a, a situation of, um, of, of a problem of yichud? And they would say also three men, five men, 10 men, you know, that would be like the most horrific idea for, for a parent to think that their daughter should be alone with 10 guys, you know, drinking or whatever it is, you know, that, but the rabbis say, oh, if there's more than one man, it's not a problem. And so the reason for that um, is that uh, Rashi says, that if you have two men, one of them will be embarrassed of the friend and therefore act won't, won't act inappropriately. Again, yeah, I don't know. Are these, we, we sometimes see today that when a lot of young men get together, they actually egg each other on. And the opposite thing happens. But actually, the Gemara recognizes this because... Uh, let's go on a little bit. Actually, I'm going to skip one source and I'll get back to the, back to the, uh, yeah. So this source, and now I'm, uh, if you're on the source sheet, I'm up to um, source number three. I'll get back to source number two. The, the, the uh, Gemara says, What do we say? That one woman could seclude herself with two men. Says Rabbi Yehuda in the name of Rav. This idea that you could have two men and one woman is only if you have kosher men. What's a kosher man? We'll get to that in a second. But let's say you have lewd men or men who are, don't have good boundaries. Trefa men, there you go, trefa men. Then afilu be'asar namilo. That even if you had 10 men, it would be a problem. And then the Gemara goes on and says this story that one time, uh, there were a group of men who wanted to, to commit a sin, who wanted to have a sexual sin with a, with a certain woman. And what did they do? They took her out like in a coffin uh, just to pretend that she was dead so that no one was suspicious. And then they got out of town and then they, they committed their sin. So, and the proof, and that what the Gemara is saying is, you see from here that having multiple men, they're not going to necessarily safeguard each other if they are prutzen, if they are uh, not kosher men. So, how do we define a kosher man and a not kosher man uh, for this law? Because this, this is very, very relevant, right? So, um, 
you know, obviously in, in single situations in college dorms and uh, wherever it is where people are trying to follow these laws. So people are very careful not to have one man, you know, one guy, one girl together in, the, in, in a room together. However, let's say there's a friend over, right? So we already just told you that let's say there is one guy and two girls, that's still a problem. If you have three or more, then it's okay. Three or more women, then it's going to be okay according to, according to the post scheme, according to the sizers. But what about with the men, right? So let's say you have two men and one woman. So what do we say? According to the Mishnah, that's okay. But it's only if they're kosher men. So how do we define a kosher man? So the, uh, the, the post can actually have very interesting ideas. Some of them just say it means, do they follow halacha? Are they observant in general? Well, again, going back to Schlissel, to I always like to think about, first of all, scenes that happened. You remember there was, there was a whole, there were a few scenes. This is actually interesting. I read, I read something about Schlissel that um, if you notice the, the technology that they use, it's like, you know, maybe like eight to 10 years behind, right? Everything they have. Remember after, after the year of mourning when, um, when Shulam, they're gonna listen to Pirche London, right? The London, the London Boys Choir, I love the Pirche London. And uh, that's what they listen. By the way, that, that song, I don't know if you, if you heard the song, the whole, that whole song there. Remember the scene, you know the scene I'm talking about? So um, they sing, Ki Yikare Kansi Prolfanecha. That's the whole idea of sending the mother away. So the, the last line they, that they were singing was the aim, the mother is rovetsas, is like hovering over her kids. And obviously thinking about Devorah, I mean, that's at least the way I understood that, that scene. It was really a beautiful, a beautiful song related to what happened. But like, they, but what were they using? They were using like an old style tape recorder cassette, right? They weren't using CDs or anything like that. Or, but so everything's, and also, did you notice their phones? Okay. Almost all of them had what kind of phone? Yeah. Flip phone. Why? Is it just because they're, they're, they're poor and don't have a lot of money? No. Have you ever heard of the idea of a kosher phone? Okay. You know, there are literally, just like you, have, you can have kosher food and not kosher food, you can have kosher phones and non-kosher phones. Basically, a, a not kosher phone is one that you can access the internet. Because once you can access the internet, you can see a lot of problematic things. So I think it was Rebel Yashiv, or maybe it was the Shevet Alevi, Rav Vazner, another. These are post that people in Shisla would, would, would go to. They actually say that, how do, you, how, how do we define someone who's a kosher man? It's if he has a kosher phone, you know, <laughs> anyone and like that's a sign. Anyone who has, who doesn't have a flip phone, right? So like in those communities, if you're at Anshin, you know, and you're eating food and you pull out a regular phone, you're going to raise eyebrows, you know, and you're no longer a kosher person anymore. At least you're, you're still obviously an Orthodox person, whatever it is. And you could be Orthodox and you could be like, uh, like Akiva putting on tefillin and praying very much. But the point is, for these laws, we don't trust you anymore. So it, do you remember, I think that after Akiva started getting some of his art accepted and with the exhibition, I think at a certain point, he did get a uh, smartphone and it was a big deal in, in, in the show. Anyways, it just, I thought that was an interesting connection about kosher, kosher men, not kosher men. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back one, one source. I'm gonna go back to source number two. Let's see if I can figure this out. Okay, no. Oh, okay. So says the Gemara, this is a Gemara, again, this is a Gemara in, uh, in Kedushan, source number two. How do we even know? Where do we know? We know that you can't have certain sexual prohibitions. Uh, there, uh, obviously, you can't, a man cannot have sexual relations with a woman who's married, with a woman who is a nida during menstrual impurity, um, with many, many different relatives. There are many different prohibitions in the Torah. But who said you cannot seclude yourself with a person of the opposite sex. So the, the uh, Gemara asks this question, remez li yichud minatar minayim. Do we have a hint to the concept of yichud in the Torah? Can we actually find in the Torah? So it actually brings a very interesting or strange source that you wouldn't think would be the source. Shanemar, as it says, ki yisitcha achicha ben mecha. The Pasuk is talking here about when your brother tries to convince you to commit the sin of avodah zara, of idolatry, okay? It's called mesis umediach. It's a prohibition of people encourage, and the halach is, you shouldn't have any compassion. You have to kill the person who convince, convinces other people because obviously the Torah is very worried about idolatry. So anyways, but in the context, it says, when your brother, the son of your mother, so the, the, uh, the Gemara asks, is it true that the 
son of your mother, your half brother from your mother's side, would he try to encourage you to do Avodah Zarah? But Ben Av, Enomasis, but the son of the father doesn't try to get you to do that? Elom Malach, it's telling you a completely different halacha. And this will be very related to the issues of Yichud, that Ben Misyachid in Imo, the Osir Lisyachid in Kol What it's telling you is because the Pasuk, which is not here in your text, it says, if your, if your brother will entice you to do Avodah Zarah, Besater, when you are alone, because no one's going to go in public and try to convince someone to commit a sin like that. So we see that the idea of being secluded, you could be secluded with your imecha, with your mother. And here we see that there's no prohibition against yichud, right, with a mother and also with other close relatives, grandmother, mother, daughter, granddaughter, all these, there's no prohibition of yichud with, okay? But but you're not allowed to have yichud with all other uh, people who are sexually prohibited to you in the, according to the Torah, all the arayos. So from here, we see, or most Rishonim, most authorities believe that we learn from here, from this source, that there is a biblical prohibition against yichud. Meaning yichud is not just something that the rabbis came up with in order to hold you back from committing a real sin, right? Yichud is actually a biblical prohibition. Now, why might you say that this is not a biblical prohibition from the Gemara that I just read? There's one word in that Gemara which might make you think that. What is it? The first word of the Gemara says, remez. It's a hint. And some people say, based on that, that this is only actually a rabbinic idea, um, but it's actually not biblical. But the standard understanding is that Yichud is a biblical prohibition. Okay. So what else do you have? You don't have in this Gemara, but I just didn't want to bring all the sources here. There's another Gemara in Avodah Zarah, in a different tractate that talks about the same concept. And it says the following. This is very important to remember. On the biblical level, there's a prohibition of Yichud with any person who's called one of the ervas, one of the sexual prohibitions that's listed in uh, Leviticus chapter 18, chapter 22. It's repeated in chapter 22. That is the biblical prohibition. So that would include, obviously, if a, a woman is a man and with a, mar- uh, with a married woman, right? I say it that way intentionally. <laughs> what about the opposite? A, uh, a, um, a, if, if you have a married man and a woman who's single, right? That technically is not one of the prohibitions in the Torah. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but that's technically not one of the prohibitions. Um, and then all the other things that we mentioned in the Torah there. Also, by the way, one of the things that's mentioned is nida, right? A woman who is uh, during the time of menstrual purity, impurity, that's also a, a, um, one of the arayos. And we're going to get to that in a second. But that's the biblical level, okay? Now, the Gemara tells us, a different Gemara in Avodah Zarah says that the rabbis added additional prohibitions of yichud. And one of them actually was during the times of King David. Because what happened during the times of King David? Maybe you remember there was a story with Amnon and Tamar, they were like uh, half siblings. And Amnon fell in love with Tamar, but she wasn't really interested in him or didn't think that it was appropriate. So what does he do? Remember the story in Tanakh, in the Navi, Amnon pretends that he's sick. Tamar comes in to help him, to give him food, whatever it was, and Amnon rapes her. And David, after that, according to the Gemara, says, oh, we see we have to make a more uh, prohibitions here. Now think about it, Tamar, right? She was a Pnuya. She was not married at the time, right? So what would be the prohibition? There, there really shouldn't be any biblical prohibition on having Yichud with Amnon and Tamar. But the rabbis say there was a rabbinic addition made to the rule to include even women who were single, okay? So that's addition number one. The second addition that came during the times of Hillel and Shammai, the students of Hillel and Shammai, would be even on non-Jews. I mean, according to Torah law, there really is no biblical prohibition for a Jewish person to be secluded in a room together with a non-Jewish person. Um, it's only because of a takana, only because of a rabbinic enactment that happened during the days of um, Shammai and, and Hill. Now, I want to talk about something for a second, which is very important and very, very relevant today. So we just said that if a woman is single, right, it's only a rabbinic prohibition to have yichud. And if, if that's the case, whenever something is only a rabbinic prohibition, there could be many, many more leniencies involved. Um, so the most common examples, or many times examples of yichud, you know, especially when you think, let's say a couple is dating, right? And they want to spend uh, time together, alone time together, right? But they also want to be very careful about all these rules. 
Now, she's not married. She's going out with him, right? Um, she's not a relative of his who is prohibited to be with him. She's not any of those things, right? So um, would she, is there a prohibition of yichud on a biblical level? So the question is, obviously, um, women who are not married are not going to the mikvah. And since women who are not married are not going to the mikvah, then all single women are presumed to be a nida, right? And the, even if they're not during the time of their, of their period, they're still considered to be a nida. And there's a debate whether women who are pnuyot, meaning they are single, but also haven't gone to the mikvah, right? And they're a nida, there's a question whether or not there's a biblical prohibition against yichud. The standard answer is yes, okay? So that obviously, you know, creates um, a lot of problems when it comes to people dating and many challenges because how can you go out with someone and actually have quality time with them and you want to spend, stay up late schmoozing and talking, but you want to be uh, cognizant of all these rules. And for that, we're going to have to come onto some of the leniencies that will, that will come up. By the way, it's interesting. Going, I'm going to try to keep going back and forth to Yichud because I know people want to, I mean, going back to uh, Shtisl. So in Shtisl, it's so, it's so funny. You think about it. It's like, these people are so from right? They're so from, and they're like, okay, we're going on our first date. Where are we going to go to the first date? Let's go to the hotel <laughs> for the first date, okay? So it's, it doesn't sound so good, right? But halachically, it's the best, it's the best play, place for an orthodox couple or anyone who cares about these laws to go on a date. Why? If you go to a hotel lobby, that's the place you know people are going to be coming in and out at all hours of the night. People are going to be going back and forth. Even if you, anywhere else, right? or many, many other places that people might want to go on a date, there could be major problems of yichud. So therefore, what sounds like the, the craziest idea in the world, actually from a halachic perspective, makes a lot of sense. Anyways, all right, let's go on. I'm not going to read the whole source inside, but the next source, uh, which is actually very interesting, source number four, talks about the following idea. It says, don't, um, this idea that if you have multiple men, or maybe multiple women, but let's go with the case of multiple men. Let's say you have two men and one woman. We said it's not yichud. That's only true if you're in the city. But let's say you're traveling. You're walking from one city to another city. You know, you're traveling or, or whatever it is. Then the halacha is, even if there are two men, it's a problem. Why? And the Gemara says, because maybe as they're traveling, one of the guys will have to go off to the bathroom, take a little <laughs> bathroom break. And then for like a minute, you know, the one man and the one woman will be left alone and it's a problem of yichud. Okay, so what do you see from here? Obviously, right? Like when we talk about yichud, what's the time? How much time are we talking about for yichud, right? So, I mean, they're talking about people are traveling, right? And maybe one guy has to go into the woods for a second to go to the bathroom and that's yichud because you're leaving. What? Where else? No, there's no rest stops in the ancient world. <laughs> If it's at a rest stop, then it really wouldn't be a problem, but it's, it's because they're going, to the, they're going to the woods. So they're going through, they're traveling, whatever it is. So that's the problem of yichud. So that means that they're thinking that yichud is much smaller time. So the way that the halachic authorities talk about yichud, it's kind of a funny way to think about this, but what's the amount of time that, that it is? Now, again, remember, I said the whole issue of yichud is that if the couple is secluded, what might they do? They might have sex. It's not a concern, even though we are concerned that they might kiss and do other inappropriate things, at, the, at least at that point in their relationship. But um, the concern of yichud is that they might actually have sex. So the question is, how much time <laughs> does it take <laughs> to have sex? That's really the question, right? So the Gemara has, says it in a pretty funny way. I don't know if it's a Gemara that you showed it. It says, the amount of time that it takes uh, litzlos beitza ulagoma, which means the amount of time it takes to roast an egg and to swallow the egg. <laughs> I don't know why they came up with that one. Anyways, now how long is that? So many posts can be like, go back and forth how long it is. So the most stringent position, I'm just reporting the information, folks. I don't, okay, so the most stringent position is <laughs> the most stringent position that I heard, again, I heard many different things. Uh, it, um, I forgot who said this, is, uh, I, I think it was also the Shevet Halevi, but I don't remember for sure, is 35 seconds, okay? 35 <laughs> seconds. Now, we have another context of Yichud, which you probably are all familiar with, right? When else do we talk about Yichud? When else we talk, not for a section, when else? At a wedding, right? What do you do after the wedding? You're under the chuppah. 
and then they go to the yichud room, and the couple has to be together. And it's actually the same idea. The idea is that if in there, if they are in a room for the amount of time that they could have had sexual relations, even if they don't, we consider it to be a full nisuin as if they consummated their marriage. That's the idea behind the yichud room. So the question is, how much time? But there we don't say 35 seconds. <laughs> there we say about like nine or 10 minutes, different rabbis say different things. And I think that the reason is because we have to go l'chumra on each side, right? So when it comes to the marriage, we want to like be sure that there was enough time that they could have had sexual relations. So we say, keep them in there alone until 10 minutes. It's anyways a good break in the middle of the wedding with all the craziness. So they have like 10 minutes that they're alone with aid them, with witnesses outside. But on the other hand, if you want to be strict and stringent and, and not be secluded too much time, so that it's going to be like 30, it could be as little as 35 seconds. Rev Moshe Feinstein apparently was much more lean about this because Rev Moshe Feinstein said that, um, Rev Moshe Feinstein said that, uh, that, again, remember, think about it. If the couple is, you know, if when they start to be secluded, they're all dressed. I don't want to get into all the details here, but bottom line is, it doesn't just take 35 seconds to get the whole thing. So, my, so Hiroshi says it's like four or five, a, 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 more time. Now, this actually is very, very relevant. I was listening to uh, one of the rabbim from uh, Yeshiva University who was giving a share on this. His name is Uri Orleon. And he said, he was talking about his first date. You know, he's a Yeshiva Bachar. He's coming back from Yeshiva and he's on his first date. And he had, uh, you go to the first date and they were in, I forgot where they were. Uh, they're in Toronto at the big tower. What's the big tower in C CN Tower? And they're there and they get to the elevator and they realize that they're the only two people going into the elevator. So the elevators go up to like the hundredth floor. It's going to take like two and a half minutes. Is that a problem of uh, yichud or not? So again, it really depends how you how long. So people are very very strict to try to figure out how much time uh, yichud is. Okay, let's go on a little bit further here. Um, Okay, let's go to some very practical different uh, uh, leniencies and different things that come up, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Fruchta for the second half of the class. Okay, so look in source number five. Amar Rabba says, Rabba, Bala ba'ir ein choshim mishom yichud. That if the woman, let's say there's a married woman, and she wants to, she's secluded with a man, but her husband is in the city, then there's no concern of yichud. Why is there no concern of yichud? because the couple, the whoever, they're always worried that maybe the husband's gonna come home, right? So therefore it's not a problem. I mean, this is like a huge, a huge issue in, in all communities who are people who are very strict about this. Let's say the wife is home uh, and let's say they have someone coming over to fix something in the house or do repairs or whatever it is. You know, and there are questions about Jews and non Jews. Let's say it's a Jewish repairman's coming over to do things in the house. And so the question is, does she have to like leave the house? You know, normally you want to be home when someone's in your house working. But from a halakhic perspective, if someone comes in, you might want to leave the house, right? So one of the major leniencies is if your spouse, we'll say, let's say your spouse, or certainly the Gemara is talking about your husband, then you're, we're not concerned that something will happen because they're, they would be worried to do anything inappropriate because the person's coming up. I mean, we, we could laugh about these things, but, you know, we all know things happen and people make mistakes. I mean, I think that I, I'll say, I believe our society's concern problem is that we don't have enough boundaries. We don't have enough boundaries. So obviously some of the th things that they're saying maybe sound a little bit going too, too much to the other side, but I think as a society, we've gone way too, in my opinion, we've gone way too far to the other side and we're not careful about these things. And we all know that things happen. And again, things will happen in the moment. It's all about, in my view, the idea and the rabbi's view about making boundaries around. Let's just keep going a little further. Amr of Yosef, here's another leniency which came up in Shtisel all the time. Pesach Pasuach Rishus Rabin. I'm in source number five. Let's say the door is open to the Rishus Rabin, to the public domain. So if there's a man and a woman, let's say Shulam and Aliza, or let's say Shulam and uh, Menucha or whatever, Edna, or actually, the truth matters, I was thinking that I don't even know. In those cases, it really could be that there is no biblical prohibition of yichud because those women were elder. Maybe they were, were, were older. Maybe they were past the time of nida. So it's actually possible that they were not dealing with a biblical issue with, with nida. But certainly with Akiva and Elisheva, okay, they just left the door open. Okay, so how does that help? It's based on this Gemara. If the door is open, it's okay. No, the halachic authorities talk about this. Does it mean the door has to be open? Does it mean that there's just a window that people could see in? Lots of different discussions about this. But the reason why it's actually very important is because 
the idea of the door being open only helps you if you can really say that people are passing by. If they're on the fifth floor of some apartment, right? And I miss, I, I wanted to show a little bit before one of the clips, it was dark outside. The roads were very quiet when Shulam was walking over to Aliza's house the first time. And they're on the fifth floor, whatever floor there are, what are the chances that just because the door is open two inches that someone's actually gonna walk in? And so it's not so simple. You know, again, this is just a TV show, but to me, it was really interesting to see that they were so strict about so many areas of, uh, of Jewish life, but they took many, many leniencies around the issue of, of Yichra, I would say. Because um, even though they did leave the door open a few inches, but it really does not, it really halachically, there are a lot of questions about whether it actually uh, helped them or not. Okay, so I, I do have some more uh, sources here. Uh, no, you have you have time, huh? Okay, so this next, we'll just do one more source here. Um, go, let's go to, um, okay, this is what actually, I think one of the most interesting uh, stories in the Gemara. Turn the page if you're in the source sheet. This is, on, uh, this is, this is again, a continuation of the same Gemara. And the Gemara says as follows. And also, you'll see from this story how worried they were about men being able to control themselves. Really, this is like their biggest concern. So there are these, these uh, captives who were taken to the city of Narda. Askinu the Bay Amram, the Bay of Amram Chasida. So now you have these women. They're vulnerable. They've just been through a horrific experience. They probably can't stand up for themselves. They were cap captives for, doesn't say how long. And now before they're able to go home or whatever it is, they're in Narda. They've just been redeemed. So whose house are you going to put them in? You're going to put them in the person who's the most pious. So they, this rabbi's name, Rabbi Amram Chasida, he's the Rabbi Amram the Chassid. He's a very pious person. So he's a good, a good person to put, put, to put them in his house. They only had a kosher phone, definitely. So Ashkulu Darga Mikamayu. But even though they put him in Rabbi Amram's house, he was still so nervous, or they were so nervous. So what did they do? The women went up to the attic and they actually removed the ladder so that he wouldn't have the desire to go up and do something inappropriate. But then what happens? The Gemara says, When one of the captives passed through, I guess there was a skylight, he saw maybe her shadow or whatever it is. He saw that there was a, that he saw her and he had a desire. So what does he do? Shakle Reb Amram Ladarga. This ladder, okay, it took more than 10 people just to move the ladder. So they thought like there's no way that he's going to be able to do anything inappropriate. So Rav Amram, his desire is so strong, he goes over, he grabs the ladder by himself, pulls this ladder that's so heavy that 10 people can't carry it, but he carries it over. He carries it by himself. And Salak of Azul, he starts going up the ladder. When he reaches halfway up the ladder, if if shach, he like spreads out his legs. He's able to like catch himself for a second as he's about to go up and commit the sin. Ramakola, so he screams out loud, Nura be Amram. There's a fire in the house of Amram. Remember, like in, the, in their towns, there were little towns, houses were really close to each other. And he starts screaming, fire, fire, fire in the house of Amram. So what happens, obviously? All the people of the town come in and what do they see him doing? <laughs> They see that he just slept over the ladder and he's going up to commit a sin with the women on, on, on the top floor. And they're vulnerable women. Who knows what he was going to do? And, and now everybody sees what he has just done. So what happens? After Rabbi and the rabbi say, come, Amr they say, Seftinan, you have shamed us, you've embarrassed us. So Amr Lu, he says, Mutav tichsafu be Amram ba'am hadain. It's better for me or for us together to be embarrassed in this world, and not to be embarrassed in the world to come. He then causes the Yetzirah to, to leave him. He makes it swear that it will leave him. I'm not exactly sure what that means. And the Yetzirah like shoots out of him. This is obviously a story here, like a pillar of fire. See that you are a fire and I am flesh and I am actually uh, better than you. It's really an amazing uh, story. First of all, actually, one time when I read the story, I, I, I actually counted the words of the story. And when it says that when he reached the halfway point of the ladder, he stopped, that's actually, I believe, the middle word of the story, which is kind of interesting from a literary perspective. And basically, the story is telling us this lesson that we, should, that we shouldn't trust ourselves, right? We say, we'll go into a certain situation, we'll be okay. And it's basically saying, when you're in that moment, 
and the challenge is there, it's very hard and we have to create separation. This is the story that immediately follows the whole story of Yichud, right? Right after all the prohibitions of Yichud, uh, this is a story. It's a very, very powerful story. It's definitely the way that the rabbis think about this. Like I said, you know, some of these laws might seem to be a little far, a little bit, you know, uh, too stringent, but I actually don't think so. I think that these laws are extremely important and they help us have boundaries before we get to, to situations that, that will be uh, very difficult. And I know not everyone follows all these laws 100%, but I would encourage people to really think about them and really think about them, how they could be incorporated into our lives and how they could actually add the appropriate boundaries uh, that we all need to have. But it was interesting thinking about Schlissel and thinking about a lot of their uh, stringencies in many other areas of life. But here they actually relied on a bunch of leniencies and we just you know, we're able to learn about some of them right now. Okay, some questions, yes. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, he's in a certain way observing the laws of Yichud. So I'm not gonna comment directly on that practice because I, I do think that uh, it's extremely important for uh, mentors, male mentors and, and bosses to make sure to figure out appropriate ways that their female employees and people who are working with them and for them and trying to grow in their own careers to be able to have that opportunity to really learn from them. Um, but I do think that people have to think about it creatively. How can you do it in a way um, that will preserve the laws of Yichud and, uh, and, other, and other things that I think are extremely important. Okay, one more comment I wanna, no, okay. Yeah. Right, it's, it's all, the, the two, those two laws together are, are really, mad. I mean, there, there is a question, by the way, with both uh, inappropriate touching and also, and Nagia, by the way, there's n people, sometimes people think, oh, I, let's say you go to someone, you wanna shake someone's hand, you know, just like as a professional thing, or you meet someone and they say, I won't shake your hand, I'm Shomer Nagia, right? And that's, I think, a misunderstanding of the halacha, okay? The, the halacha is referring to touch, which is sexual in nature, or, or something which could be too intimate, which could lead to something. Having just shaking someone's hand is not, that's not what it's actually referring to. Uh, in the halacha, they talk about chibuk uh, v'nishog derech taiva or derech chibuk. They talk about certain kinds of touch, which is inappropriate. Shaking someone's hand is not the issue at all. But other kinds of touch, you know, I think that those things are, are definitely, and, and I think that all again, another thing, I think in modern Orthodox communities and certainly to the left of modern Orthodoxy, I think that people are not so careful about these laws and people, people obviously figure out what they have to do. But I think that what for sure has to happen is that people have to respect other people's desires around this. And people just make assumptions about other people that they wanna, ha wanna have the, uh, want to be able to kiss each other out the cheek. And not everyone wants to do that. People want to have more boundaries and that's certainly appropriate, especially in our Me Too world. You know, people, people this, is, this is a big issue, I think. And I think that the laws of Yichud and the laws of Nagia actually could help us in many ways around that. Okay, I'm going to stop uh, my part of the uh, lecture. We'll turn it over to Rabbi Fruchter. Now I should help you with your uh, audio, but I won't be able to. <laughs> okay, well, go hang out with your computer and see if anyone wants to... I'll answer about Facebook. Oh, Lord. Hi. So um, I'm really honored and excited to be talking about this uh, with you alongside Rabbi Antin. Um, what I love so much about the show, I binge watch a lot of things. All right. Like I don't normal watch TV ever anymore. It's like, give me like six episodes and that's a night, you know? Um, but there's something about Shtisel. It's the only TV show I've ever binge watched that made me feel like a better yid after I was done. Um, and I like felt really good about binge watching Shtisel. I found myself like thanking Hashem, being like, Haste Hashem, right? Or, um, you know, like listening into a sugya while someone was uh, steiging in the base medrash. So um, I'm grateful to the, uh, the writers of the show, the directors of the show, also because now you, we're all here together learning Torah about Shtisel, not to sensationalize the practices that, that are going on in the show, but actually to find the access points that make sense for us. Um, so I'm really excited to be talking to you. I'm gonna probably skip the clips because I, I took some screenshots just for the sake of uh, um, ease of use. Um, I think my notes are somewhere. 
want to hand me that pile, please? Thank you so, so much. Okay. So it's interesting. We just talked about yichud, right? Seclusion. So does yichud apply to a married couple? No. Why not? Seems to be like even greater temptation. Once you uh, have a sexual history with somebody that when you're secluded alone with them, there might be a temptation. So as you might know, um, it says in Leviticus 15, Vayikra Tetvav, there's a category called nida. There's a category where while a woman is menstruating, she and her partner are forbidden for ha from having sex with each other. And the punishment as cited in Vayikra Chaf, Vayikra 20, is v'nichretu shnei amekher v'amam. They suffer the punishment of kairet, both of them, actually uh, experience spiritual excision, right? It's very, very high prohibition. And single women, as Rabbi Antin said, always need up, unless, yeah. And, but uh, married women actually cycle in and out of need up. So why is it uh, that a woman, a married woman uh, and her partner, why, why are they allowed to be alone? Any ideas, any guesses? So there are two halachic reasons for it. Okay, one is that they will be permitted to each other eventually, okay? So you could say that, all right, we can wait. We can wait, we can't uh, be together now because you are in your period of nida, but you will exit when you go to the mikvah, but for now we can wait. So that's number one. And number two is an idea called pat bisalo. The bread is already in the basket. <laughs> Do I need to explain? No, okay. Um, great. So uh, there's this idea that that's, those are the two reasons why yichud for married couples is permitted. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say that that's the case in every culture where there were menstruating women. Uh, menstrual taboos are across the world, um, in the ancient world. And sometimes there was something called the red tent, right, where you left totally, right? But in Jewish law, you actually stayed in the same bedroom, but with all of these boundaries, right? Um, so I want to talk to you about one particular issue in the next 10 or 15 minutes, and that's this picture right here, um, this screenshot. What do you see? Who do you see? Devorah Allah Shalom. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, Shulam, right? And so they're sleeping in two separate beds. Do you notice anything else about the room? Shout it out. The lights on. Okay, fine, good. Not sure how relevant, but yeah, keep going. There's a nightstand between the two of them. There's also a shape in the corner, which I love. Um, but something I want to talk to you about is the fact that they are in two separate beds. Now, this is because of a law. You could turn the light back on, I think. Thank you so much. Um, the laws around separate beds have to do with a category of law called har chakot. From the root, rachok, which means far, distance, right? So nida is the prohibition against a married couple having sex with each other during the time of menstrual impurity um, and the seven clean days after that. And har chakot are the boundaries that actually keep you from getting to a maybe not such a good situation where you're on the cusp of, um, you know, uh, having sex. So har chakot, there's a whole range of them. And... They come from this pasuk in Vayikra, ve'el isha binidat tumata, lo tikrav legalot ervata. And to a woman in the tum'ah of her nida, do not approach to uncover her nakedness. So if you were chazal, looking at this uh, pasuk, if you were the sages, what laws might come out of this verse? What do you think? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so you have a few pieces here. You have do not approach, and then you have to uncover her nakedness. So what do you got, Gila? Got something? Yeah, uncovering. uncovering, right. So it could actually be literal, right? You're not actually allowed to uncover um, your partner during this particular time. But if you look in the yellow, you're also not allowed to approach period, right? Oh, no pun intended, right? You're not allowed to approach at all. Um, and it, it becomes a prohibition of any kind of touch whatsoever. There is a difference between sexual touch and casual touch, but all actually become um, boundaries during this time of nida. Um, and it's interesting, this is not an easy practice. This is a challenging practice. And 
I found that in the show, I'm just showing you this screenshot for a minute. That's, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name. Thank you. So Lipa, so if you look, if you think about some of the most emotionally charged moments in the show, uh, many of them happen in the bedroom and many of them happen while each of the characters is sitting on the edge of the bed almost leaning in so, so strongly and wanting to touch the other person. Um, and actually I caught a, a few times uh, them saying in this context, I have something really important to tell you, right? And almost like a desire um, to reach out and touch the other person. The clip I was going to show you was the moment where um, Shulam unplugs the phone. Remember that? Um, and the flashback and uh, Devorah, what happens? They're sitting in their beds. And what does she do? She slaps him with a pillow from her bed, right? They're like sitting on the edge of their beds and there's this boundary that gets broken. Maybe that's usually there because of her rage, right? And there's also the moment where um, Gitty, Gitty, um, her, his, wow, I'm not a good fan. This isn't good. Um, where uh, there's like a hand-holding moment, right? In the car. So these little signs of affection when they're absent, I think it's really affecting some of the more intense dynamics between the couples. Um, so why separate beds? There is an explicit law here in the Gemara in Masachik Tubot, in Tractic Tubot, that there are specific things that someone who's in Nida cannot do for their partner, uh, including filling the cup, making the bed ready, washing the face, hands and feet, which every woman loves to do for <laughs> her spouse, um, right? Um, so th there is an explicit law not to uh, do many things with the beds. And one of them in particular is establishing separate beds, okay? Um, I actually learned this source with someone one time and uh, she, with her um, partner, uh, I was teaching them for their wedding and she rolled her eyes and she said, I am not not letting you fill up my, I'm not not filling up your cup while I'm Anita. That is disgusting, that is archaic. I am a feminist, I am not doing that. And there's this awkward silence in the room and he goes, I actually find it really cute when you pour me a drink, right? <laughs> so it's interesting. I think um, like what the Harcha coat do without kind of being apologetic about it, I think they provide some language for couples to talk about the things that are erotic and are not erotic in their lives. Um, so, and in order to observe them properly, you have to figure out what those things are. Now, in the context of Stissel, everything is, right? It's just, total black and white uh, in terms of the laws. And uh, one of those things uh, is the beds. Um, there are different approaches in halakha for how to do separate beds. Oh my goodness, it's popping around. It's frozen, sorry. It's frozen, that's, that's not ideal, but it's okay. Um, so just to go over some of the halakhot pertaining to the bed, it is forbidden for a couple to lie on the same bed during this period of separation, even if each one is fully clothed, actually. Um, and even if each one is lying in their own mattress, if there is a box spring underneath the two mattresses, um, they can't lie on two beds if you're, uh, if you're following some of the more strict interpretations that touch each other. And what you're seeing in Stissel is actually another opinion, which is that the beds have to be one and a half to two feet apart from each other. And some say even there has to be a partition between the two beds so that if you're flailing at night, you don't touch your partner by accident. Um, so these are really, really intentional distances that are created uh, between the couples. So it's, Rabbi Antin and I were talking because it's interesting, sometimes in, with couples who are observing Nida, the beds are pushed together right, during the time of the month where the person is not in Nida and the couple is able to be together. And you never see that in Shtisel, right? Can you think of one time where there's a man and a woman on a bed in Shtisel? Because there is. Come on, fans. See what you got. Anyone on the Facebook? Yeah, very good. So Bubby Malka, right, um, with her Spartac boyfriend. Um, so, you know, that's important because it's so clear in every bedroom scene that they're separate. And what was so striking about that moment is that they're not. They're just hanging out, right, um, on the bed. Um, and I think that's actually really a powerful thing. Um, sorry for hopping around so much. 
Okay, so here are just a, a basic list of what the har chakot, these, these laws are. I think we'll probably hit more of them as we go through the show a little bit. Um, and there they are, there they are, look at that. And okay, and there's a tangential thing I wanted to share with you and then we'll stop for questions. Uh, there's this moment where uh, Akiva is sleeping in his mother's bed. You remember that? And so I was thinking about uh, the fact that his father says, get out of your mother's bed, right? But let's switch beds. And so he switches the bed. He's like, all right, that's fine. And I was thinking, does this have anything to do with Nita, right? Uh, because in addition to the distancing laws, there's also some holdovers from the days of purity and impurity in the temple and some kind of heebie-jeebies that come along with women who are menstruating. So there's some like overlap. Some of it is really just formal halacha about the separation uh, in order to prevent a sexual encounter. But some of it really does uh, have echoes of a menstrual taboo. So I was wondering, maybe her bed is infected with nida or something. I don't know. Is that not a nice thing to say? Probably not. Okay. Um, so I, I looked into it and I don't think that's what's going on. Um, I think what's going on, here it is, is that there is a halakha in the realm of kibud av of honoring your parents, where you're not allowed to sit in a parent's chair. Okay. Now I grew up with this. There was my father's chair at the end of the table. We were not allowed to sit in it or even think about sitting in it. Um, and that is a kiyom of kibud av of honoring your parents. And there is a taz, there is a commentary that says this extends to beds as well. So there is this moment I, uh, where he realizes they're talking about something um, that kind of challenges uh, where maybe Devorah would feel comfortable. I don't remember exactly, um, but he pauses Shulam and says, let's just switch. There's something kind of infringing upon the honor of your mother here. We need to switch. Yet. I know. So on the let's talk about Stissel group, they're all very upset that they switch beds, you know, um, because it's like a movie inconsistency situation. Um, so if you look, what's going on in this scene though? Who's that? That's Ruhami in her father's bed. And her mother invites her to sleep there, right? And if you think about the dynamic of that particular family, and knowing the halakha helps here because you know that in a way it's a little bit of a turning up the nose um, to the father in this situation. The fact that she's sleeping very comfortably in her father's bed um, and there's no worries there. So I want to stop here. But anyone have any questions about a thousand things related to Nita? Yeah. You want to turn the lights on? Yeah. Bashi. Good. Okay, so, so what Bashi is saying is that there's a point in a woman's life where um, she is no longer in Nida anymore, right? She's stopping to have her period and she goes to the mikvah for the last time and that's it. And if you think about it, if you're giving birth a lot, there's a lot of time where you're not actually in Nida. Um, but the beds remain separate. Couldn't find a source for this, but I think there is something culturally about not suggesting that you're in a time where you are sexually active with your partner. Um, and so your kids might see whatever it is, you keep them separate all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, I, mean, I understand, obviously, you know, kind of on a shock level, I mean, there's a lot of fluid, there's a lot of blood, there's a lot of everything, but. Sure, sure. So Gila asked a question for those online about the childbirth scene uh, with Lipa singing to her on the phone. I thought that was pretty beautiful that there was a way for him to be there really intimately without being there, because in the context of that community, that was not appropriate. But in the modern Orthodox community, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Linzer has a beautiful uh, tshuva response on this issue of being in the room during childbirth. The reason it's perhaps an issue is because when a woman gets to a certain point in her labor, she becomes nida, um, just having to do with possible bleeding and, and uh, an idea that there is no 
an opening of the uterus without uh, blood, right? Um, so Rabbi Linzer argues that there would be room to hold a hand during childbirth and do different things. But in this community, that was not the case, right? In addition, probably to other cultural things that I don't understand. I mean, if you watch Call the Midwife, anybody? Obviously. Um, there's also, you? Get on it. Next, next Shior series. All right. Um, so there's, there's cultural things about women's spaces and men's spaces, right? Like you don't infringe on the women's space or the men's space and the childbirth room, that, that is not a man's space. So I can imagine that comes into play as well, um, even without the need of stuff. Any other questions? For either of us, yes. Teaching interior structure so that the system mm. is inside the person, and I'm not saying that it eliminates the need for outside boundaries, it doesn't. But it seems to me that without that internal sense of what is right and wrong. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And we, we all know that the presence of external boundaries, of halachic boundaries does not stop abuse, right? It doesn't stop anything, right? It just creates different situations. And I think, can you think of um, a particular area in the show, I'm looking at you, but anybody, where they seem to be really good at working on character or the inner life? Well, they're, they're all the same. Oh. Kitty, Kitty and, uh, and uh, Buster, and the bardic, and going in and asking for mail, like that she's working on her, on her uh, yeah, get to work on our ethical nature. There's also the there's a big thread about education, like chinuch. Um, so there seems to be some misplaced ideas about how that works um, and the candy bar and all that kind of things. Maybe we could do that for one of the classes. But any other thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> Sir. No, no, go, go, go. Right, right. That's when he forgets. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but the thing, the thing is, so first of all, there is a whole halachic issue when we talk about the open door to the Rosh Hashanah, to the public domain. Does that mean that the door is open? What if there's just a window? In other words, if people could actually see in, and I believe that that, that room happened to have had glass, uh, glass all around it. But the thing is, it was actually in a pretty secluded space. So even if people, like, the chances that someone would have, it definitely would not have been the kind of thing that people in that community would do. That was Akiva. And I think, don't think it's an accident that that's the day that he forgot to put on his stuff. And that's why it had such an impact on him, the fact that it was the first time that he didn't put on fill-in in his whole life. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wonder if it's an accident that, 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 that those two things came together. But yes, but there are a lot of issues in terms of Yichud. That, that comes up in terms of office buildings. Let's say someone comes in and wants to meet with somebody. You can close the door if there's a little window in the office and come in. You know? so there, these, these questions have, have a lot of relevance in terms of even practical questions for today in terms of office spaces. Okay. All right. Okay. If you have any more topics, um, actually some people like Bashi and others sent us wonderful emails with great topics. If you could think of other topics for future classes, uh, we're always interested and we will pick up next week, next Tuesday night, same time, same place. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah.